So my name is Elaine Petrucelli, and I'm a very lucky woman because I get to introduce Paula today. And uh, a few months ago, we had the privilege of lunch with Paula, and I know you're all jealous. <laughs> uh, but there are good things about being a book passage bookseller. One of them is not how big your hedge funds going to be. However, <laughs> I have to tell you, getting ten colleagues together, all of us reading, circling the sun, and then getting to sit with Paula and talk about it is really one of the most memorable afternoons for me. I just loved every minute of it. And that's how I feel about Circling the Sun. When I was reading it, I had to race home at night because I couldn't wait. Beryl was waiting for me. Yeah. And no, Beryl is not a completely sweet person. <laughs> and and um, not everyone who comes to Book Passage is completely sweet, but most of you are, if you came to this maybe. But uh, it was so much fun to really delve into her. And uh, I loved Paris White. I, I, it was one of those books that, again, just transported me and let me see the depth of someone I kind of knew about, but didn't know it really with no deep down about. And that's one of the beauties of great fiction, is that it can tell the truth in ways that mm -hmm. some history can. Yeah. I loved West with the Night. I bet mm -hmm. you did too. Yeah. I thought it was a brilliant book. I insisted that my book club read it. We all loved it. But when I finished, I still didn't know Beryl. And I feel now that Beryl and I, you know, I don't know if she knows me, but I sure know. <laughs> so I am so thrilled to be able to be here today to welcome Paula McLean, I think one of the great writers of our time. So thank oh, you, Paula. <laughs> wow. Well, I hope I didn't give away any of the juicy parts. <laughs> Good afternoon, and God bless you for coming out on like one of the most beautiful days I have ever seen. But I live in Cleveland, so <laughs> none of them look exactly like this. And thank you, Elaine. This is a really special store. I'm sure you guys yeah, yeah. all know that. But I didn't really know the store except by reputation until last spring when um, we came out and did a lunch. Here in this, I think it was in this very room, which was one of the, the, the nicest afternoons I had remembered spending. And part of it is Elaine and her particular glow and how much she loves books and advocates for books, but her staff, and we just had the most remarkable conversation. I felt like I was in the middle of a literary salon. <laughs> anyway, it was phenomenal, and I'm just delighted. In fact, I've been pointing, I've been on tour since the 27th. This book has been out only since the 28th, so it's still new. It's got that new book smell. Um, <laughs> but this is the event that I've been most looking forward to, and part of it is like, you guys know how lucky you are, right, that you get to live here. Mm -hmm. anyway, it's my pleasure. So thank you, Elaine, for inviting me out here. Um, so yeah, I had the same experience um, after reading West of the Night that um, as and, and, and can we see, see some hands of people who have read it? Yeah, okay, so I'm going to talk to you, like, like I already know you. Um, <laughs> that is remarkable a book as that is, in terms of Beryl e expounding on her adventures, and, and, and that book has such great style and is so much fun to read. The experience when you know when you finish is, but where's the where's Beryl? Like where's the goo? Where's the real woman? And that that was what I wanted to know. But I have to back up because I actually didn't know Beryl Markham at all or West with the Night until just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And all of it, it's almost like every step of my journey as a writer has been about um, ignorance <laughs> <laughs> and chance and great good luck. I actually went to graduate school in the 1990s to write poetry. And I probably don't have to tell you that is not the way to get rich and famous, <laughs> right. writing poetry. Um, and I actually didn't care. I love language. I grew up really loving words. And I just wanted to, to get as, um, as, 
uh, close to language and as good with words as I could possibly get um, until I died. That was my goal as a writer. Uh, this was in the middle 1990s. I was writing poetry um, in graduate school, and I had a two-year-old and was a single parent, and I would I have this very strong memory of um, you know, going home from these workshops where people were, were reading my poems for the first time and like making mac and cheese for my two-year-old and having to work on a term paper on Wallace Stevens and change transformers into beast mode. And that was my experience about Ann Arbor. I don't think many people have that exact same experience of Ann Arbor. But when I was at Michigan and I would tell other writers there, my colleagues in class, what it was, um, how I grew up, they would invariably say, you should be writing a memoir. And how I grew up was down the road in Fresno, California, mm. in the 70s and 80s, um, in the foster care system. Oh, wow. Yes. So I spent 14 years in the California foster care system from the time I was four, when my mother left, until I was 18 and aged out of the system and started working in a nursing home for $2.87 an hour. And I had no health insurance and no car insurance and no bank account. And I mean, my sisters and I laugh about that now. I mean, because it seems so, so very far away. But when I would tell people in Ann Arbor about my experience, they would always say, well, you should be writing a memoir. And my answer was always, well, you know, I don't write sentences. <laughs> <laughs> and I had never written, I didn't write stories when I was growing up. I had always written poetry. Like, that was my language. But I was very intrigued by this a memoir. And I love a challenge. And I just thought, well, why not? Who's going to tell me not to? And I, so I lowered my expectations just right down to here. And I just thought, so what's the worst that can happen? Maybe I'll fail. So I started writing that book. And then some really remarkable things happened. I got a New York literary agent and to a poet. That's like Oz. Like, you're not even sure that person actually exists. <laughs> you're not even sure. And yet, that person did exist and was really interested in my work, and then was able to sell the book to a New York publisher. And I just thought, this is it. Oh my God, it's coming up roses. Everything, all my suffering, all of it is now going to pay off. And I was fairly sure when that book came out, and this was in 2003, and it was published by Little Brown. Um, Oh my God, like that day, the pub day, right? I just waited. I just waited for a Hollywood agents to call me on the phone and for my ticker tape parade down Madison Avenue. Seriously. My expectations were not at all reasonable. They were, they were, they were ludicrous. And what really happened was I got in my um, ratty blue Subaru and drove to my very first literary event ever. And it was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. How glamorous. <laughs> How glamorous can you get uh, to go to Minneapolis, Minnesota? And even I had some TV that morning. And I did radio, and there's a notice in the newspaper. And I went to the bookstore, and there were five people there. And I knew three of them. <laughs> but mostly what I'm here to tell you is that is the, that is the experience, you know, like really what seems glamorous and what had always seemed glamorous to me, right? Sometimes can feel a little like schlepping your own books out of your car in the Safeway parking lot. <laughs> it sort of feel that way. Um, but in another way, I was doing what I loved, what I absolutely loved, which I consider a privilege. And I just knew that I was going to keep on doing it. And um, so when the memoir was sort of in the, you know, in the, in the, past, um, I lost my literary agent and I lost my publisher. Um, when you don't make money, when you don't sell books, there's this very nasty thing called book scan. And they can tell, like, to the copy how many books you've sold is terrible. Um, it's terrible for authors, but really good for booksellers. Um, I lost my, my agent and I lost my publisher and I had to start all over at the beginning. Um, and I decided, well, if I have to start all over from the beginning, maybe I'll write a novel. Again, like, how bad could it be? <laughs> Maybe I would just fail, and that would be okay too. I didn't know anything about writing a novel, um, and it took me five years. 
five years because I was teaching myself how to write a novel as I was doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And reading everything and just sort of like, it just felt like such an education. I was schooling myself in the writing of the great American novel. Um, I also had little kids at this time, little, little kids, and would um, have to go up to the library to work because they just, at the minute I walked to the door, you know how it is when your kids are little, they want everything. They just want all of your time and your attention. They want your soul through your eyeballs. <laughs> and the writer Islet Waldman, who lives near here in Berkeley, says, they want the foam off your latte. <laughs> <laughs> they just want everything. And so uh, there was no such thing as writer's block. It was my, the, my favorite time of the day was that one hour that I would go up to the library and just disappear into this world that I was creating. And it took me so long because I didn't know what I was doing, but you know, stumbled my way through that book. And, and this was 2008 by the time this book was, was finished and I got a new agent and I got a new publisher and I went back out on the road. <laughs> and this time I drove three hours through a blizzard to Pittsburgh, because I was living in Cleveland at the time, um, to a Joseph Beth. You guys probably don't know those stores, but they're in the Midwest. To a Joseph Beth where there was one person there. There was one person there, and I didn't even care. I'm like, I love you. <laughs> Let's not talk about me. Let's talk about you. Can I buy you a coffee, and will you be my friend? Um, <laughs> and seriously, I wasn't. I tell these stories because it's, because it's part of the experience, but I was never going to stop writing. I mean, it didn't matter what the... The, the reception was in the world, the part that mattered was the, my finding my way creatively and finding a way to get these projects done and following my heart and my instincts and my intuition and building these books out of nothing. I mean, it's a pretty delicious thing, making something out of nothing. You start to feel like a, a sorcerer a little bit or like a ninja some days when it's mm -hmm. going well. But it did start to occur to me because my books weren't finding an audience. And that's part of it, too. Just writing in the dark, writing blind, and then not finding an audience. It was a little bit, just felt like something was missing. And I started to think that maybe what that thing was is that I hadn't yet had a big idea. Like I hadn't had a big idea, but I also didn't know how I might find one. Um, it's not like you can just like go to Costco with a cart, you know, <laughs> and find a big idea. Um, and right around this time, and this was com a complete fluke, I happened to have uh, stumbled on um, Ernest Hemingway's A Movable Feast. Um, right? I had never read it before. Any of you guys know that book? I think you guys know that book. It is not a nice story. <laughs> Hemingway, you know, tells some pretty nasty tales about his very good friends. Nobody could lose friends like Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> um, but what I was discovering is this whole side of Hemingway that I was completely unfamiliar with. So he wrote the book at the end of his life. It was published posthumously. There were pages of a movable feast in his typewriter, but it was about his early days in Paris when he was a whippersnapper, and he had never published anything at all, and he, all he had was this passion and a purity of, of heart, just right, in, right full across the board, mm -hmm. and, and to sort of discover himself as a writer. Hi, how are you? Um, and he was also newly in love with this woman, his first of four wives named Hadley Richardson, who I had never heard of before. And as I was reading Movable Feast, I had the most profound, I was so moved, and again, it's not a nice book, mm -hmm. and yet I was moved to tears um, by the, the, the love story, like how Hemingway, when he starts to drink the Kool-Aid, right, and believes his own genius, mm -hmm. and believes that he can rewrite the rules, loses the great love of his life, like that was so moving to me, and I just wanted to know more, like who is this woman, who is Hadley Richardson? And how did they get to Paris, these two? And how did, how did they even meet? Because Hemingway doesn't tell us anything like that. I mean, then what really happens so that they lose each other? I just really wanted to know. And I just let my curiosity take it from there. I didn't know if there had been 
biographies written about Hadley Richardson. Like I said, I'd never heard her name. So I drove myself to the library where all good things can be found. And lo and behold, there were two biographies about Hadley. And I just let the first one fall open. Do you guys ever read books that way? You sort of just like let a book fall open and see mm -hmm. what it might have to teach you. And there was just an excerpt of a letter um, that Hadley wrote to a friend not long after she first met Ernest at a party in Chicago in 1920. And there was something about the quality of her voice, some thing that leapt off the page, right, right at, off the page at me. And I just had this immediate sense of her. So her humor, her her intelligence, her particular point of view, her thing, you know, like her zhuzh, like her thing, leapt off the page and I just thought, I know this girl. This is my girl and this is my book and I don't care what happens now, I'm gonna write this book. And I just and I just did it. Because it took me five years to write the first novel and I thought this story is too good, like, I just want to take a risk. So I quit my teaching job. I actually was working three different teaching jobs at that time, sort of adjunct teaching, you know, how you have like 120 students and they pay you in dog food. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> online, but they pay you $1.50. And then it was pretty, it was actually pretty demoralizing. But so I quit, the, I quit my <laughs> teaching jobs. My husband and I borrowed money from his parents so that every day, I could write in the Starbucks near my house in Cleveland. And my favorite joke about this book is, what's the furthest thing away from a Parisian cafe that you can possibly get? <laughs> <laughs> a Starbucks in Cleveland. Um, and it, it was remarkable. It was remarkable to sort of schlep into the Starbucks every day with all of my research books. I had never done research before. I didn't even know what I needed to know only that I was going to give it everything I had. And I would sit in the same brown chair every single day. I couldn't afford an office, so for $1.85, I could write at Starbucks every single day. And I swear to God, I'd never been to Paris. What did I know about Paris? I was just hoovering up everything I could possibly find, read everything I could find on Hemingway, and just felt that my writing life had become a time machine. That whole history was unknown to me. I didn't know anything about Paris in the 20s. I was learning it as I was learning about this love story, which was incredibly moving to me, and learning about this life of this woman that I was absorbing, almost as if I was starting to channel her. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's what it felt like. It felt like I was an actress in the role of my life, and that was Hadley Richardson, and somehow I had been lucky enough to find her. And so she just swept me away. I didn't have the, the, I didn't have the permission to use her actual words, but I found that there was a cache of love letters in a, in a library in Boston, the John F. Kennedy Memorial Library, and I could go there and read all of her letters, thousands of pages mm -hmm. of love letters because Ernest Hemingway saved everything. <laughs> and so that's, I know, I know, right? He saved everything, that man. And I went and just read all of her letters and started to feel like I had the, the confidence and probably audacity to think I knew and, uh, you know, something about this woman's essence and that I could follow her down the rabbit hole. And there she is in Paris in 1922. Oh, she's in Gertrude Stein's salon. And to know what she's thinking and feeling. And that book was like magic. Every single day was the best day of my life. <laughs> because it was working and it was sweeping <coughs> me away. It was like being strapped to the side of a rocket ship and the story was just going and all I had to do is hold on and not screw it up. That's how I felt. And um, I wrote the book in seven months. Oh, wow. Seven months as opposed to five years. So there's a learning curve there. <laughs> there's a learning curve there. Um, and then when the book launched, every good thing a writer wants happened. Like cherries lying up on the slot machine, right? Mm -hmm. I was out on the road in Ann Arbor, in fact, where I lived on $12,000 a year, writing term papers on Wallace Stevens and making mac and cheese for my <coughs> two-year-old. And that was the day I got a call from my agent saying I'd made the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> and I'm hopping up and down, like alone on the road, you know, shrieking and 
hopping up and down like the like really and that there was there it made it even more delicious um, and I'll always remember that and I'll always remember that I happened to have been in Atlanta last week when I got the call again about this book many mm -hmm. the times list so that's always a very happy day mm -hmm. but the book just kept on going like I went out on the road to do like 10 events and I tr kept traveling for almost a year and a half um, 77 weeks on the New York Times list and I kept thinking people were getting something wrong right because I had never had nothing had, or I never had readers before um, I would go to events and it would be standing room only and I'm like am I in the right place <laughs> <laughs> am I in the right place um, and you know there are no detectives in my book <laughs> there are no detectives and nobody dies on page three there's no pornography right it's about marriage and writers and true love and literary ambition anyway it was so much fun to go out into the world and talk about these characters who have been my imaginary friends and um, and it sold whatever 1.6 million copies it's absurd <laughs> but then when it came time to follow that up suddenly I had readers Everything I ever wanted was on my doorstep, but like in a ruinous way. You know, I had all these readers saying, what are you writing next? I'm like, I have no idea. And then my publisher really wanted to know what I was writing next because the formula had worked so well. So wouldn't the formula just keep on working? Wouldn't I just have to find another woman from history who is inspiring, who can shine a light on some little corner of history? And wouldn't that work? Well, intellectually, yes. Intellectually speaking, it should work. Um, but I couldn't find it, you know? I couldn't find it. I had a couple of ideas, but then they never led anywhere. Um, and I was pretty unhappy for about the first two years after Paris Life came out. And then I started writing in earnest, and I found uh, another subject, and I started to work on a novel about Marie Curie. Marie Curie, that should work. She's so inspiring. She had such an incredible life, and there were all sorts of things in her personal story that I connected to. I thought, and I get to go back to Paris in 1894. Um, there's no sex, but there's radium. You know, there's no sex, but there's radium. And, um, and I just started to do all this research, and it was so interesting to me. I honestly think I know more than a human should possibly know about physics in 1894. I just felt like I was learning all about her laboratory, about pitch blend, and there's poor Marie like stirring a vat of pitch blend for about 20 years, you know, with an iron bar that weighs 20 pounds, and, and it was boring. It was really boring, and my editor um, was was really bored and, and she felt quite free to tell me so. <laughs> um, and it's really too bad, but I wasn't surprised when I would get notes from her about the latest draft. I worked on this book for two and a half years and I kept thinking, any day now, any day now I'm going to find it. I'm going to find the thing. She's going to leap off the page at me and it'll be like magic again. Any day now I'm going to find the voice. I'm going to find the point of view. I'm going to be able to, to bring this story to life. Because what it felt like was, you know, a mannequin. Like, a, like I'm pushing a mannequin around, like in a shopping cart. And it was horrible because I just had the sense, like, I didn't even believe myself. And the dialogue was so flat, and I just couldn't get the engine going. And it was making me very unhappy, in fact, because all the stuff that had been, like, I don't know what to tell you, like falling in love with Hadley, right? So special, and then changed my and then changed my life, and changed the arc of my career, and all the things that I thought I knew now about writing, I couldn't actually apply to the story at hand. I couldn't make the book work, and I couldn't make it good. Um, and around this time, I went on vacation with my sisters and my brother-in-law in Orlando, Florida. And I was I was deep into that book and, and very unhappy and um, and uh, so I thought I should drink a lot. <laughs> That's what writers do when they're unhappy. Right? <laughs> yeah, that was gonna make it better. That was gonna make it better. Anyway, I just had this have this memory of sitting uh, in Orlando with my sister and my brother-in-law is there. My brother-in-law is a, a doctor, but he's also a hobby pilot. 
And that weekend in Orlando, mm -hmm. he was reading um, West with the Night by Vera Markham, hmm. a book I'd never seen before, about a woman I had never heard of before. And he kept looking up from the side of the pool, looking at me and saying, you need to read this book. This woman is amazing, and you're going to be inspired by her. You're going to write about her. Oh, yeah, right. right. But people tell me all the time what I should be writing. Uh -huh. I've never done an event where somebody doesn't come up to me afterwards <laughs> and say, you know what your next idea should be. Right? So there he is telling me, you need to read this book. This is going to be inspiring to you, blah, blah, blah. Well, I ignored him. He's my brother-in-law. I always ignore him. <laughs> totally, totally. And thank God he ignored me right back. He like shoved the book in my hand at the end of the weekend. And he's like, you are reading this book. This is going to be important to you. So I took it home, and I put it on a shelf in my dining room, not even in my office, and it sat there for a year and a half. Oh, oh my God. Bottom shelf. Bottom shelf. <laughs> that's how I feel about my brother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day, at the edge of reason, I pick up the book. It falls open, and the passage that I read is from Beryl's childhood. Um, and it was about as subtle as being struck by lightning. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood up on end. I just thought, first of all, damn, what have I been doing for the last year and a half when this book was here in, in my house? Um, and I just knew I was going to write about her. No matter that I didn't yet know who she was, I just, that thing, that thing that had been missing, mysterious, profound. I have no idea what it is. I don't know why things move us. I don't know why things sort of strike a fire um, and, and create what, you know, this immediate engine of curiosity and empathy and gives me the ability to attach to a character, right, to a person, but one who actually lived, like that's the extra magic on top. And so here was this whole new woman that I didn't know, and the same thing happened. I just felt like I rocketed into her biography. I just wanted to know everything I could possibly know about her, and you know, particularly after living with poor Marie in Paris, like, stirring a <laughs> fish blend with the bar that weighs 20 pounds, like suddenly it's like, oh honey, I'm going to Africa. Like, oh. <laughs> It was so much fun, and I just plowed through West of the Night. You guys know the book. It's so yeah. mm -hmm. extraordinary to think, who is this woman? Oh, my God. She's oh, like Calamity Jane. But she happens to look like Greta Garbo. <laughs> she takes no prisoners, and she, she's fearless, and she tackles this stuff. And, and I, I just couldn't believe after reading West of the Night that I didn't know who she was. Like, how had she been overshadowed by history. So her historical significance is that she was the first woman to fly the Atlantic east to west the hard way in 1936. I didn't know who she was. We all know who Amelia Earhart is. Right. So what, what, what was going on there? So I had that question. Where had she been all my life, right? But the other question I had which was what Elaine was talking about. So you read West with the Night, and you're like, but where's the, the stuff? So she was married three times, my barrel. There's not a mention of a single husband in West with the Night, right? No. No. I started reading these biographies, and one of the first things I find out is that when Beryl was four years old, um, her mother picked up one day and left Africa for England, and then didn't come back for 16 years. Mm. And when I read that detail, I just thought, OK, this is just too weird. Mm. Because I was four years old when my mother mm. left, and she was gone for exactly 16 years. Wow. Yeah. You cannot make that stuff up, mm. right? So then my project became something else. At the moment I found out that we had this this, we shared this emotional and biographical DNA. I couldn't help but look at her life in a certain way, that it was because of this, these losses in her early childhood and the way she's forced to reinvent herself as the girl that we know from the middle of West with the Night, sort of that young warrior in training that 
hooks in with the indigenous tribe on her father's land and like learns to to use a slingshot and like hunts warthogs and um, becomes this leggy, wild-hearted, wild thing, right? Mm -hmm. That girl. Mm -hmm. But it's that girl then who also grows later into this woman who takes no prisoners. And that's what I just started to think. Like it was Beryl's early losses. It's how she learned to push back against the world that created this woman that we know today. And that's why I started writing about her personal story rather than, for instance, going right to the good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Right? The transatlantic flight or the, I mean, it wasn't, her accomplishments are striking to me, but my curiosity had every, I think I'm a pop psychologist too. <laughs> my curiosity was really very directed at her, her personal story. West of the Night was first published in 1942 and then kind of disappeared. Um, when it was republished in the 1980s, Beryl was living in poverty in Nairobi. She was often living in poverty, actually. She seemed not to know what to do with money. Um, I sort of like that about her. Um, and it was really, if you don't know this, the reason that West of the Night was able to be republished in the 1980s was because of Ernest Hemingway, mm -hmm. my other friend, <laughs> Ernest. Um, Ernest, at one point after West of the Night had been was out, wrote a letter to his editor Max Perkins and said, "Have you read this book by Vera Markham? Yeah. It's a bloody wonderful book, and she can write rings around the rest of us." Well, he also said some nasty things about her. <laughs> Called her a high grade bitch. Um, but he said that about lots of women, so yeah. we can't, yeah. we can't take him too seriously. Anyway, so he wrote this letter to Max Perkins. The letter kind of disappeared, and then when his letters were, were reprinted, when they were published. Um, his son John, who is my character in The Paris Wife, Bumby, um, Hadley and Ernest's only son, was living in LA and he had a really good friend who was a restaurateur and one day he was showing his friend his letters, his father's letters. And in that pile was this letter that Ernest had written, Max Perkins saying, have you read this book by Barrow Markham? It's a bloody wonderful book. And he's like, how come, who's this woman? Like, who is this book? What is this book? And he looked for it and it was out of print. And he managed to get his hands on a copy, and he fell madly in love with it. And he just thought, this is an extraordinary book. Like, how is it that it's disappeared? And so he wrote Beryl in Nairobi and said, you have written an amazing book, and I'm going to find a way for it to be in the world again. And she didn't even believe him, and then he did it. Mm -hmm. And it became a bestseller. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how it was that Beryl was able to live at least at the end of her life in some comfort and, and notoriety in her small community in Nairobi. I just love that. I love that mm -hmm. my friend Ernest, even though he was saying nasty things about her too, yeah. is really, in, in a way, sort of responsible for the reissuing of West of the Night. It's, it's an extraordinary book. I'm really glad that it's alive. Um, and so when this book was done and um, I knew that you know it's it's that it was going to be in the in the can, and I submitted it to my publisher. I went over to Africa, um, and when I was working on the Paris book, like I said, I quit my job. I was dead broke. I wrote in the Starbucks every day. I couldn't have afforded to go to Paris. Like I didn't have two dimes to rub together. And because something really special happened with that book, I thought maybe part of that was my not my having. I invented it. I invented Paris. I had to get there through my imagination. And, and in a way, like you can't visit Paris in 1922. You have to imagine it. Right. And I'm like, you can't visit colonial Kenya. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, I'm going to write this book, and then I'm going to go over there as a way, basically just to pay tribute to this woman who has been so profoundly important to me. And she really saved me, honestly, because I'd kind of given up on myself. I had sort of given up on my creative process. I just thought, it's never going to happen again. I'm never going to meet anyone that electrifies my imagination in exactly the same way as Hadley. And now I know it's just about finding the right, the right one, the right magic, the right chemistry, whatever that is. Anyway, so I went over to Kenya, which was the coolest thing I've ever done in my whole life. Mm -hmm. Just unbelievable. And Nairobi today is like four million people in high rises. And um, if I had gone, I don't think I would have found her. 
You know, Nairobi and Barrel's Day was, mm -hmm. you know, tin shacks and goats mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and eucalyptus trees and red dust. And I just think that I would have gotten lost somewhere yeah. along the way. Mm -hmm. But much of Beryl's world is under there. If you know where to dig, for instance, you can find the Mutega Club, right? If you guys have seen Out of Africa, yes, the movie Out of Africa. Um, still there, sort of unchanged since 1913. Um, I was able to go to the Wilson Aerodrome where Beryl learned to fly in 1929, um, to Karen Blixen's house, which is a museum, which is phenomenal, to Dennis Finch Hatton's grave. Um, and then I went to Injoro, 100 miles up, up country from Nairobi, where Beryl grew up on this horse farm. And it's still a horse farm. Mm -hmm. And I was able to stay in the cottage that Beryl's father built for her when she was 14 years old, mm -hmm. which is still standing. And you guys can rent it because mm -hmm. it's there. It's like a and b you know? Oh, wow. It's There's extraordinary to wake up before dawn and kind of go walking through the horse pasture. And there's the green hill that she talks about in her book. And to mm -hmm. see her view and to smell her smells. And those are her stars. And, and I just have to say, you know, it's the thing about the <coughs> genre, which is completely addictive to me, because the thing about writing about people who actually lived is you can go into the world where they lived and meet people who actually knew them, and it's extraordinary. I met a guy named Buster Parnell, who was Beryl's jockey for 20 years, mm -hmm. and he's 80-something years old, right, and he sat in the sun on this uh, lawn chair at the Inkong race course and told me great stories about Beryl. He called her the the great unconsummated love of his life. <laughs> he was such a stitch. And he does this great barrel impression, too. But he kept, he kept stopping when we were talking and saying, I'm, I'm not doing this very well. I, I'm getting this wrong. I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to describe her. It's like, all I can say is there's no one like Beryl who has ever lived, and there never will be again. And I thought, I think you're right. And he said all sorts of things about Beryl, and it, but he always says some nasty things. He's like, I love that woman, but she hated women. <laughs> she hated women. I just thought, that didn't sit right with me. I don't know. So I had another uh, meeting that day with a, another uh, colleague of Beryl's, a woman, who was also another racehorse trainer in Nairobi, iconoclast, strong woman. and. Her name is Patty Migdal, and she's 92 years old, and she invited me into her house, and we sat and had tea, and I just felt so honored to be there. And I said, Patty, do you think Beryl hated women? And she got a funny look on her face. She's like, well, don't be silly. Beryl didn't hate women. She hated people. <laughs> <laughs> she hated people because they had wounded her because she had suffered, and that's why she preferred animals. And that's why she became the particular woman she became. And again, that was, that was the girl that I met, too, when I started researching her life. And that's the girl I've been spending time with. Like, I'm in a Thelma and Louise movie, um, and it's really fun now to go out on the road and, and to um, introduce people to her life if they have not met her. So thanks so much for coming out this afternoon. Thank you. So if there are questions, I would love to chat with you a little bit, if you have them. Yes, ma'am. Um, just to go to Tara's wife, because I haven't read your new book, but I can't wait. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was amazed how you could write the dialogue of Padlet, because I think you said you couldn't use her quotes or something, but you had her letters. That's right. So how, did you, how do you get in their heads to right. be able to do that? Okay, so the thing about historical fiction, and people have this question all the time, like how much is fact, and how much right. is fiction, and what can you make up, and what, what can't you make up, and how is it that we can write about people who actually lived, and, and it's still fiction? So because it's a novel, in a way, anything can happen. I could have made Ernest Hemingway a cross-dresser, and some part of me kind of wanted to. <laughs> you can say anything happened because it's a novel. It's fiction. What you can't do is use words that actually exist. So I couldn't use any two words together in Hadley's letters or in Hemingway's manuscripts or in his fiction. 
So that's the part where I had to just kind of, um, I think of it as like riffing, like jazz mu musicians or something, mm -hmm. sort of like riffing on her voice. I had read so many of her letters, I kind of knew her turns of phrase. But it's sort of like it is. It's like an actor's trip, kind of getting inside her skull and sort of seeing through her eyeballs. And the reason I think that the dialogue um, works, I studied dialogue at the knee of Ernest Hemingway. I mean, I feel like I was reading him so obsessively, particularly The Sun Also Rises. It's a clipped quality and sort of that time period. For whatever reason, I just really like that time period, too. I love the 20s. and. Um, I kind of love what's not being said, too, and the intensity of what's not being said, sort of what's under the surface, and that's Hemingway's whole thing, right? The iceberg principle. You know, you might see one-eighth of the iceberg, but all of the weight is underneath. And to mm -hmm. me, really good dialogue is people not telling each other what they actually are feeling. Mm -hmm. It's underneath, right? Um, it was so much fun. It was so much fun to write that book. And, and again, to feel like I was getting a, a tutorial in the writing of dialogue. Um, that was magnificent. Thank you. And just one other thing, when she stays with him for so long, it's just amazing. And you want to shake her? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. I wanted to shake her too. Yes, ma'am. I don't know if I read this, um, if I read it incorrectly, but is it true that she burned all her letters? Oh, Hadley. Yes. Oh, so okay. yeah, no, it's okay. So as I said, Ernest Hemingway saved everything. It's why we have all of those letters from the early days. Um, Hadley saved everything too until 1926 when he left her for his second wife, Pauline Piper, and then she burned them, mm -hmm. which we can kind of mm -hmm. forgive her for. There are six letters that exist from that from that time. Um, so it was a really interesting experience when I was researching and doing the book is like some of what I found, it was almost like a ghost story or a, um, following a shadow, for instance. I had Hadley's letter responding to Ernest's proposal. He proposed in a letter. I don't know that letter because she burned it, but I have her response, you know what I mean? So it was this very interesting, uh, like a ghost chase. It was really fun. Just a couple of uh, closer in uh, pieces of information that I came across in my life. The restaurateur, who was John Hemingway's friend, owned Ondine and... Um, is and that the, right? The right? See how cafe. much you know? Wow. See, and now he's only just described in biographies. He's George Goodkiss, right? But I don't know who he is, really. Okay. So he was a big deal. That's a restaurant in Sausalito. Oh, oh yes. Yes. In See? It's not <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And the other is that KQED produced, um, in its heyday of producing documentaries, yeah. did a documentary in 1987 mm -hmm. called World Without Walls. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. so there's that. Mm -hmm. I guess oh, my oh, only, I, and I want to tell you that Beryl Markham and Georgia O'Keefe are my patron saints. <laughs> but it's not about their art form, it's about how they lived their lives. Yeah. And you touched mm -hmm. upon that. And I'm startled by your um, connection with Beryl Markham and her life that way. The question I will remain, <laughs> will a man ever inspire you the way those women have? You mean as a subject, as right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> inspire me on occasion. But, no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And certainly there are men in my books all the time. Hemingway inspired me. You know, I wrote in his voice, too, and all the dialogue and the chapters that are from his point of view and the third person. But what you're saying is something else, which is that it's, these, it's really these women's lives that are capturing my imagination and magnetizing something. Do I think a, a man could sort of um, ignite my curiosity and my the engine of my inspiration in the same way? And I don't, I, for a while, not to be, not to be sexist, for a while I think I'd really like to do this because it feels like a feminist act. You know, to take up these women's lives that, for whatever reason, have been overshadowed or eclipsed or marginalized, um, and sh and sh this is this is my toolbox. This is what I can do, right? 
is to dramatize their stories and give this bit of history um, with them at the center. You know, Hadley Richardson was written out of The Sun Also Rises. Hemingway was a wildly autobiographical writer. Everybody who was in his life is recognizable in that novel, and the only person in his life who is not there is Hadley. And so it felt profound to me to be able to put her right back where she belonged and to write those chapters from her point of view because she was there and she earned that bit of history. Mm -hmm. And so here's Vera Markham, and I didn't talk about this. For those of you who haven't yet read the book and have only read West with, West with Light, you know, something that she neglects to mention along with the husbands, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, was that for 10 years she was involved in a juicy love triangle with Karen Blixen, mm -hmm. who wrote Out of Africa under the pen name Isaac Dinson, and Dennis Finch Hatton, the great safari hunter, who I personally call Robert Redford. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here's this whole story. She was there, and yet she's not there. Beryl's not in Karen's book. Karen's not in Beryl's book. But essentially, it's kind of the same thing. Here's the woman that was written out of out of Africa, and I get to put it right back in. Uh, <laughs> and that's a pretty cool thing. Why was she written out of um, The Sun Also Rises? Why was Hadley? Yeah. I mean, I, I they don't. They were married. Yes, they were married. I only have guesses, you know, and my guesses are that's a really dark story. Nothing, nobody, nobody comes out alive and the sun also rises. It's a desperate tale. And I like to think it's because Hadley was sort of too, she had, she had risen above all of that. She wasn't in all of that mess and, you know, the human goo and the turmoil and people trying to ruin themselves. And it, these were, you know, it was like the desperate, emotionally desperate times. And that she was, you know, she was his, what? Beacon of light. Yes, exactly. And so he didn't want to sully her. But it's also possible that he was just obsessed, you know, with these other characters and he just didn't see a place for her in, in that world. Maybe one more question if there is one. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm on page 183 of Circling the Sun and I'm just loving it. And I keep going back and looking at the cover. Because the Isn't it colors, pretty? <laughs> the colors of the cover, the clothes, the drink. I mean, it's just, it's just everything glows. Yeah. yeah. And I'll say one little story about the cover because, of course, all of this matters, right? I've been walking through airports yeah. this week. How fun to see it sort of glowing <laughs> out of the Hudson. It's really, 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 really nice. So the first time. Yeah, the first time I saw this woman, she's a real, she's a model, she lives in New York, she's also a photographer, um, they had her on a blue background and she was just sort of looking off into the distance, very regal and clearly stunning, she has gorgeous hair, um, but it didn't tell a story, and we knew that the book needed to tell a story, uh, as the cover itself needed to tell a whole story, and so somebody found a still from out of Africa, where Meryl Streep has been working all day and she comes back to the farm and she's sitting there and she's in that pose. Right. Oh, yeah. Just like that. Yeah. And and then so Random House says, Okay, beautiful beautiful model, wear those boots. <laughs> that shirt, the scotch, the thing my editor went out and found found that red ten chair and they're like, This is the picture. This is what it is. And then, and then they made the photograph. But if you look at it, it's like everything works. Like, I want to wear those yeah. boots. Right. Oh. <laughs> I want to drink what she's drinking. Mm -hmm. I want to think her thoughts. Like, it's just, I think it's like riveting. Mm -hmm. It's like magic. Anyway, thanks so much for coming out this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.